good. Love you. Thank you, Casey. Way to go. Good singing. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Carrie. If y'all don't know, this is my niece. I don't know if y'all know this or not. Come on. I love you. Well, where are you going? Okay, get my pulpit. Get my pulpit. And uh, I have two more nieces here today. I have Amy from Florida and McKenna from uh, Indiana. She's here. They're sitting right down there. That's Marty's uh, granddaughter and daughter. Nice to have you all with us. Come on. And then my son surprised me. He walked in. Right there he sits in the third seat over there. Come on. His, uh, they're at the, the Winter Jam is at the uh, Rupp Arena tonight in Lexington, and he'll be there playing. We were going after the service, but he surprised us. He said, Dad, you got 20 bucks? I said, yeah, I got 20 bucks. <laughs> I'm teasing. Uh, I do want to mention that tonight from 6 to 9, uh, we'll be beginning with the betrayal all the way through the uh, resurrection uh, tomorrow, 6 to 8, opening with Drummer Boy uh, through the entire entourage. That is tonight. That is from the Dave Nell. And the Leon and his guys, boy, they're doing a good job getting all this done, aren't they? It looks good, don't it? Looks good. Okay. Well, let's continue uh, <clears throat> with our series, Push. My uh, deacon, elder over here, he's in the first service, uh, Daryl Tyus. He told me Thursday at Bible study, at uh, men's Bible study at 10 o'clock, that uh, he was in parach parach parachute school, and they, were, they would stand there at the opening of the uh, plane door, 10,000 feet above the ground, and you held on to this little bar, <laughs> you looked up, and if you didn't go, they, they pushed you out. And uh, boy, that's just a, I don't, want, I don't want to do that, y'all. I don't want to be pushed out of a plane. I just can't even think of that. This just scares me. Our granddaughter, Sydney, she's in South Africa. At South Africa, she just uh, bungee jumped off the tallest bridge in the world, and uh, I, I don't get it. I don't. You're just a nut. That's all there is to it. You do that stuff. Um, <clears throat> but last week we talked. You know, Aunt Simone, who was the aunt to Jesus, the sister of Mary, wanted to push her two boys to the front of the line, James and John, who Jesus uh, nicknamed the sons of thunder. And Jesus is a week from crucifixion. He and his disciples are walking to Jerusalem. And Simone, her name means peace, uh, she stopped Jesus in the road and said, can my boys, one of them, when you enter to your kingdom, your new kingdom, can one set on the right, one set on the left. She was so overwhelmed. She was so overwhelmed with the ministry of Jesus, so overwhelmed that her two boys were disciples, walking right alongside with Jesus. And so she didn't have a problem at all asking this question. Now, Jesus, he didn't rebuke her. He didn't rebuke her. But he said this in Matthew 20, 22, and 23. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? They said, oh, yes. They replied, we are able. Well, they did drink of the bitter cup of suffering, as Jesus did. And here's how we ended last week's sermon. The sons of thunder paved the way so that you and I could be here today and worship freely the disciples paved the way so you and i could serve freely paul the apostle he paved the way so you and i could worship freely today jesus christ the son of god paved the way for us that we could serve the church that he has died for early on in uh, our marriage joy and i i had just graduated from college in florida and we moved to North Carolina. Joy had graduated as well. And we went to uh, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. We wanted to live there for three to four months before I took my first ministry job in Richmond, Indiana. 
working with my dad as a youth minister. Joy's parents had been in Africa for 28 years and were now home in North Carolina making a uh, transition uh, to Guam, the Micronesian Islands. Palau was one of the first islands that they worked on. They would be there the next eight years. And so I, we wanted to be with them before they went to Guam. Now, my father-in-law, my, my in-laws, they were very, very, very Christian. <laughs> if you, you know what I mean? They were oversaved. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying they were, they were really saved. I mean, when they got it, they got it. And they wanted everybody to know it. And, <clears throat> I mean, he, my father-in-law, we'd be watching TV. We were just newly married. And my brother-in-law's there. He, he hadn't gotten married yet. He was finishing up college in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And we were all, and he would, really one of the first times I was with my father-in-law watching TV. He had that remote and when the commercials came, he'd turn off those commercials. He didn't want to see them. And there was silence in the room. <laughs> Awkward silence. And, and then he would turn it back on. It was just, that was my father-in-law. But listen, one of the godliest, one of the, one of the most godliest guys I've ever been around. We love talking about ministry. I love listening to his stories of Africa. I just would take it all in. I would drink it all in. It was, it was great. Today, he's in assisted living. He's 95 years old. My mother-in-law she's uh she's in the big city she's in heaven now one afternoon while being there that first month my brother-in-law and i decided to go to the mall to play some games at the arcade now if you're a product of the 70s or the early 80s if you remember those uh those electronic games those games like galaga which i was really hooked on uh, pac-man space invaders and the most boring game they've ever created, Pong. That was, uh, that was a boring game. I think I even, right there it is. <coughs> we, but man, you, <laughs> there it is right there. Uh, now, I had to use the big paddles. I was a novice, you know. But anyway, there you have it. We came home from the mall. My father-in-law said, well, where you been? Well, we've been at the mall, and we've been at the arcade, and, and my 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 brother-in-law was he was just kind of shaking me off you know and so i said yeah we we were there we were playing galaga and pac-man and a real boring game called pong and i was trying to make light of the whole situation because i could tell right away he wasn't interested in what we were doing and i heard something for the first time that I'd ever heard and he said there is only one addiction that's talked about in the bible really and he told us what it was. And I had never heard that before. And I, I said, well, you know, I let John beat me. And, and uh, boy, he looked at me again. He's just trying to, he's trying to say, don't, don't, don't. <laughs> well, you know, an addiction can be bad. We can be addicted to a number of things. Addiction is this, by way of definition. An addiction is... Uh, something that a person can be addicted to, whether it's a substance, a thing, or an activity. And it can bring you harm if you don't have checks and balances on that addiction. For instance, I'll give by this way of example. He committed himself to being a thief to finance his addiction. It's all kinds of addiction. There's addiction to money. Uh, there's addiction to work. Uh, there's an addiction to food. We all have maybe an addiction. Do you remember the show, My Strange Addiction? It was on from 210 to 215. Never watched it. Couldn't. My gag reflexes would not allow me to watch it. Some girl, you know, eating paper for 10 years every day. Eating paper. I said, you're just a nut. That's all there is to it. One guy for 20 years ate rocks. But the one <laughs> that, that I had to laugh, I didn't see it. I was just checking it out online because it came to my head. She was a tanorexic. She went to the tanning bed three, day, three times a day, and that's her little girl. She doesn't even look human. Uh, so if you're thinking about going to the tanning bed, 
<laughs> Don't do it. So we all got addictions. You say, well, hey, you know, hey, Matt, why don't you be a little transparent? What's your addiction? Well, I've shared with you. I like Twinkies every night. Hostess Ho-Hos, um, Donut Sticks, Honey Buns, Spin Wheels. I can't wait till they start selling Girl Scout cookies out there. You say, what, every night? They're out there now? Already? Kelly, you got them out there? All right, she's already out there selling them, some of you guys. I love it. I can't wait. Every night. I've had it for the last five or six years, cookies, every night before I go to bed. But I haven't had them for the last... Three nights, haven't had any cookies. Say, well, what, what's the deal? In preparation of this message, you wouldn't want to do it or anything? No, we didn't have any milk in the house, and that's the reason. <laughs> i got to have an ice-cold glass of milk with it. I was questioned. Somebody questioned me last week after my message. He said, did you really have a bowl of SpaghettiOs? And did you really have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and Cheetos and two honey buns and a glass of milk uh, at, at 9 o'clock on Sunday night? I did. I did. I had a bowl of SpaghettiOs, and my wife did correct me after the service. It wasn't Cheetos, I will, I stand corrected. It was cheese puffs. I love cheese, <laughs> you dig them? Um, I, I have a white dog, and it was yellow by the time I get none, because, man, I love them. So everybody's got this little addiction. I have called the Twinkie hotline, by the way. So I'm trying. Hey, listen, let's get serious. You know I need to be afraid. I need to have some fear about my consequences. That's what's wrong with our country. When there's a lack of fear, when there's a lack of law. You know, Scripture says in Proverbs, when people cast off restraint, they run wild. Jeremiah says the heart is wicked. Who can know it? You know what? We need the fear of God. We need, we need the fear of law. I need checks and balances in my life. You know, an addiction can take me to a place I don't want to go. And we all have known someone, an addiction can take someone to a, to a death. This is very scary. And I think of that, and I think of James 1, verse 14 through 16. It says this, temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and my dear sisters. David Robinson was considered the best basketball player in all the Naval Academy. He played for the Spurs. David Robinson was probably the best, one of the best centers that ever played in the NBA. He was seven foot one. David Robinson, early on in his career, decided that he was going to do things different than everyone else was doing them. And, you know, traveling as a young age all over, you know, to different cities and playing basketball, meeting a lot of different people and you know, of course, uh, confronting different temptations. Here's what he decided to do as a young man beginning his basketball career. He said, I've decided I'm not going to the club. I'm not going to the bars. I'm not going to expose my mind to the music I may hear. I just, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Because once I expose my mind to the evils, that evil stays with me every day. And then he said this, and this is very biblical. Dave Robinson, David Robinson said, the only way I found out, and this, this is what he said, to defeat temptation is just to avoid it. And that's where you got to dig down deep. That's where you got to push yourself. You can't do it on your own. God's got to help you. Now listen. Let me just totally do a 180. And I want to read 1 Corinthians 16 and read these verses and that expression that my father-in-law gave me over 40 years ago. I've never forgotten it. 
and I want to read you in the context of the chapter of what he meant. 1 Corinthians 16, beginning in verse 13, says this, Be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. You know that Stephanus and his household were the first of the harvest of believers in Greece, and they're spending their lives in service to God's people. I urge you, dear brothers and sisters, to submit to them and others like them who serve with such devotion. I'm very glad that Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus have come here. They have been providing the help you weren't here to give me. They have been wonderful encouragement to me as they have been to you. You must show your appreciation to all who serve so well. The churches here in the province of Asia send greetings in the Lord as do Aquila and Priscilla and all others who gather in their home for church meetings. And the brothers and sisters here send greetings to you. Greet each other with a sacred kiss. Here is my greeting in my own handwriting. The Apostle Paul. If anyone does not love the Lord, that person is cursed. Oh Lord, come. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Now, there were a series of people who walked with Paul, the Apostle Paul, and not only did he encourage, not only did they encourage Paul, but they were encouragers to everyone in the church. You see, Stephanus was one of the first converts that Paul had ever uh, witnessed to and was converted to Christianity. And he hit the ground running. Aquila and Priscilla were those there at the first church of Corinth. And they were so, they walked, this lady, they walked with Paul. And they were encouragers to those in the church and to Paul himself. Stephanus and his whole family were committed to serving the church of Jesus Christ. And they were, they were all so, so committed. Now, verse 17, I want to I read verse 17 here in 1 Corinthians 16 once again. Verse 17 uh, says this, I beseech you, brethren, that you know the house of Stephanas, uh, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and then they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. There it is, that's the King James Bible. There it is, that line, they have addicted themselves I'm very glad that Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus have come here. They've been providing the help that you weren't given. Now, Paul is not, Paul by any ways is not at this point exhorting or really criticizing. He's just saying they really brought the encouragement that you needed. You needed to be, you needed to be pushed because he talked about their devotion. He talked about their serving. He talked about the the life they had led and now that they were leading and that they were serving the church, Aquila and Priscilla and Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus. And they were there. He called them to bring them because he said you needed to be pushed. And that was in verse 17. We'll read it again. Verse 17. I'm very glad that Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus have come here they have been providing the help you weren't here to give me and there are things that you can bring a speaker in like we had alex mcfarland the first year he comes in and he encourages all of us with his message two weeks later greg lyons comes in and he encourages us i'm so looking for men's night on march the first when alex mcfarland is coming back and then kirk kirkland from revive city church is going to be here and we're going to have a men's night March the 1st, a lot of giveaway. There's going to be a lot of encouragement. There's just, it's just going to be a great night of coming together as men. So a church, you know, will do these things, and this is what happened. Verse 18, the end result, they have been a wonderful encouragement to me as they have been to you. You must show your appreciation to all who serve so well. You know, there are people in your life that make you a better person 
Right now, you can think of somebody, yeah, that person makes me a better person. And we all have those people in our lives. And Stephanus and those guys that I mentioned, Aquila and Priscilla, uh, they made pe- better people. Like I, Paul wasn't criticizing the church. You know, sometimes people come into a church, it's a new church. You've got to understand, these churches that were being planted, this one at Corinth, this is first century Christianity. I mean, they're in the bed of persecution. Christians were dying for their faith. But these decided, no matter what, and that's Matthew 20 and verse 22 and 23, coming to life, drinking of that bitter cup of persecution. But they said, you know, whatever we have to do, we're going to follow Christ for what he's done for us. And if we have to drink of the cup of suffering, so be it. Because, Jesus, you've done so much for us here on this planet, here on this earth. We have these years, and we love it. We're going to live more abundant and free. But we know that when you reach to the, that when you get into your new kingdom, and then we arrive with you, and you call the church home, we'll all be together, and eternity is a long time. And we want to serve you, Jesus, while we're here. So there are people that make you a whether it's in a business, whether an organization, uh, <clears throat> whether, you know, you might want to know more about mechanics and the car and somebody's a good mechanic, you'll get, man, it makes you a better mechanic or a better musician. Somebody takes you to another level. Uh, somebody who, deve- man, they just push you to be a better person. Glenn Randall, you know, he's, he's at home with the Lord. He passed in 2021. He and I were the same age. For 30 years, just about when the weather permitted, we would play tennis. And uh, he was a great tennis player. Glenn, Glenn would play um, three days a week, sometimes four days a week. And he was really a good tennis player. And he would call, hey, let's go. I said, well, you know, I would, and I'd try to, but I just, you know, one day a week is about all I could muster. And I never beat Glenn in the whole 30 years that we played never beat him he was so good he would he would just he would toy with me you know he could see I'd get I'd be getting upset you know trying to play the best I could and then he would just he'd let me get as close as I could and then he'd wipe me out and he would he would switch I didn't know he'd switch to the left hand I said man I'm really doing good right now and he said well I'm playing left-handed you jerk and so there was just Glenn was a great tennis player. He made me a better. When I played like my wife, I could just slaughter her. I was so good. God loves it when we serve. And God loves it when we serve his people. God loves it when we serve his church. Now let me say this. And then I'm going to give you three simple points and then I'm going to be finished. Um, people's lives are really busy today. Uh, people have a lot of extracurricular activity that they're doing. I mean, they're just going, 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 going. Especially if you have children, maybe even grandchildren. I mean, you are, you're always on the go, you know, and your children you may be in school and they've got extracurricular activity. I, I'm going to say this right now. Quite frankly, quite, quite frankly, I don't get, I don't understand how, like Leon and these guys and the people that are in this uh, Easter passion play, how they commit themselves. It's unprecedented. It's unbelievable, Dave. And you yourself, I know you live with this thing and have lived with it for the last 17 years and, and you've put all your life, we think it's really awesome. I love it. And I just see the commitment is, it is beyond imagination. And uh, how the camaraderie is built. It's, it is incredible. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. I know here, I know how you do it. You love it. You love it. And your love for Christ. You love it. And you love to see how it affects people. And, uh, you know, it's, I can't wait till it, it, it happens. It's going to be here before we know it. But I know that people lead busy lives, and you would say, well, I just, what are you getting to? Well, I'm talking about when it comes to serving the church. This is not for people who are already serving. Some of you are, you serve all the time. I see you here all the time. It's just unbelievable. 
uh, but maybe you're checking church out or maybe you're checking Christianity out or maybe you're just somebody's invited you and you don't know where to plug into you'd like to maybe you've just started attending and um, you know well that's that's why all this stuff out there you know just to check out the tables and you know to see hey where could I serve you know maybe it's a greeter a stand at the door maybe if you you come to the 11 o'clock maybe at 9 30 you, you can come and be a greeter I challenged the ones in the uh, the 9 30 service I said you know if you you don't have to rush out maybe you can serve a cup of coffee or you know uh, hold a door for somebody or do maybe work in the nursery or you know just just check it out and just pray God where, where would you lead me there's nothing like there's nothing like plugging in I promise it could be on a Sunday it's not a it's not a lifetime of commitment you know but once you start wow there is nothing like being addicted to the ministry of the saints I love it I can tell you I love it uh, my wife and I we 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 love it I heard a comedian uh, say last week he said man I went to church my whole life he said I have put my time in I am not going back and even though it was wrong what he was saying it was really funny but I told my wife I said you know I'm glad my parents drug me to church I'm glad they took me to church there were times I didn't feel like going but I wasn't going to say anything I went my friends were here and I just loved it I enjoyed it and my wife and I we we eat drink and sleep church and ministry and we talk about it all the time and you know we we talk a lot about about y'all we're always on our knees when we're talking about you okay <laughs> yeah right I just lied but we love it and we love you and there's three simple things three simple things number one I love serving I love serving the church because I love Jesus and I love the local church because Jesus Christ died for the church Ephesians 5 said he bled for it he died for the church he gave his life for the church so I love the local church you are the church we make up the church we come together and and we worship like we worship this morning and we study the Word of God together and you know we we grow together and the Spirit of God just fills us up and we just want to please him with our lives and our our faith becomes stronger the the church of Jesus Christ is the most anointed organism in the world today it's because it was birthed by Christ and for the last 2,000 years the church of Jesus Christ has pushed forward and lives have been changed people have given their lives they've they've traveled across the world to give their lives for the cause of Christ and it is a beautiful thing so I serve because I love Jesus and I, I, I love the church. Secondly, it makes me accountable. It makes me accountable. There are times I'm sure, you say, man, I just feel like laying out today. But you know, when you have a serving position, you, ah, man, I, I got I to gotta get there. I got to get to church. Some of you, you, you you've been a greeter and you, you hold the door and you've met people and you, you come to know them just by the door. They come in the same door. And you're holding the same door. How you doing? And you've really struck up a relationship. And you got, you know, you you get together. You have a meal together. You're borrowing their car. You're going on vacation with them. You're doing all kinds of stuff. Just it's just it's just wonderful how God. It's a day we give to Him and we serve Him. It makes me accountable. And the last thing is this, as we stand together, it refreshes us. It refreshes us. Serving the church refreshes us. And it encourages us. That, you know, when, when the Holy Spirit gave gifts to the church, he gave those gifts severally as he will to build one another up, to strengthen one another. And as we strengthen each other, because, you know, you can... You can come into a service and, man, you can just, whew, 
The whole world has just caved in on you. You got this going on and this going on and this going on. And it's just like a breath of fresh air. You know, I can, I can come to church and my spirit can be lifted. And I can help, even if I'm going through a dark time in my life, I can help someone along the way and show somebody the, uh, the path of righteousness or the, the path of, of serving and how it enlightens and how the Holy Spirit directs us as we move forward. You know, I was thinking of some of the old saints that have come through this place. And Casey, he sent me about, I don't know, 20 clips last night of Dr. John speaking. Just a minute clip. And man, it was really, it's funny. You picked out some funny ones. But I thought, man, some of the names that he mentioned, and Harold and Barb nicely, and how they just have served and served and served. And, you know, their health is not like it used to be. They're a lot older, and, and, and their health keeps them from coming. And they watch us online, but wow, what a servant. This morning in the first service, 97-year-old Lano Bell was in his wheelchair, and his granddaughter and, and, and grand, uh, grandson-in-law uh, brought him to church. They bring him every Sunday. 90s. He drove a bus here at this church for 46 years. 46 years. It's crazy. It's crazy. And every time we have a, something like legacy or some kind of a maybe a, a night meeting or something like that, he's going to be here. He, he just loves it. Now, he's done his time, you know, but he's still praying. And behind them was the Harlesses. They've been here for 50, 60 years. And, and Miss Harlan is still teaching up there in the children's area. It's really crazy. I met a... I met a couple, of course, I know this couple. Their names are uh, Brandon and Lauren Wright. They're veterinarians. They're doctors. And uh, they take care of our doogie. And uh, they come every Sunday. They sit right back over there. And I saw them. There. Everybody had left the auditorium pretty much a few Sundays ago. And there they were standing with their little girls. And they said, man, they just, our little girls absolutely love Ken and Kim Wilson and that nursery and uh, they just can't wait to get here to church to see their friend Ken and, and Miss Kim they love it you know I think man that is and and they've been working in there over 40 years isn't that crazy it's crazy and they don't want any alkalis they they don't want any uh, you know to be noti noticed they don't want to be lifted up. They just love serving because they love Jesus. They're accountable, and it refreshes others. Amen? Well, the altar's open, and God's speaking to your heart. This wonderful music team, they are absolutely wonderful, absolutely wonderful, are going to lead us in a, in a song of, of invitation. And for whatever reason, you just find a place here at the altar, and uh, you can pray, stand, kneel. Somebody will pray with you if you choose or you just want to stand by yourself. That's fine. But as they lead us in this song of worship, uh, you come forward as you see fit. Lord, we pray right now for everyone that's in this room. We pray for whatever's on their heart. We pray that you would just talk to them, Lord. The Holy Spirit, let them direct them, Lord, in this way as we, we lead in this song. In Christ, I pray.